Good morning, everybody. Hello. It's Natalie from Creative Makers. I am happy that you're here. And I am here today with Peter S. Hi. Hello. Good morning. Good morning. Um, Peter Hess is in my art circle, barely in my art circle. My art circle isn't big enough to encompass Peter Hess. <laughs> I didn't even know I was in an art circle. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. I thought I, it was kind of a square. Or it's oval. it's definitely something. But I mean, you're. I I I don't feel. I mean, well, anyway, I don't even want to tell you about what I don't or do not feel. Do or do not feel. Uh, in any case, I'm just going to start this. Hello, first person. Thanks for being here. Um, all right, I'm going to start the way I always start everybody. I want to know about what creativity looked like for you as a kid. How did it express itself? Uh, well, it was kind of automatic. I didn't think about it a lot. I think uh, I was just drawing, and uh, I was kind of a bad kid, so when I was in elementary school I was drawing textbooks and stuff like that and got sent to the principal's office and uh, yeah, I just drew on everything and uh, read comic books and copied them and you know probably like most kids but I just took it a little, you took I it a little farther <laughs> I didn't stop you know. so so growing up then you I mean you just definitely gravitated towards drawing and that was just your thing were you conscious about like trying to copy stuff, like make it look like whatever it was supposed to be looking like? Hmm. Well, I didn't like do, you know, draw still lifes or anything or, you know, I, models. Yeah, no, I know like that. that that doesn't usually happen as a kid. And I wasn't doing abstractions. Yeah, I would say they were, you know, ships with people on them and, and uh, superheroes and things like that when I was a little kid. Then. Yeah. How did it change as you got older? Uh, well, I guess maybe when my, you know, parents started taking me to an art museum or art museums or something, you started seeing, you know, now there's more to this. Look what these people are doing, you know, maybe I can do this or something like it, you know. Mm -hmm. or, yeah. And uh, when got older and, you know, a lot of drugs, drop acid, do drawings, you know, I, hard to pinpoint exactly. It just evolved. You know? Yeah. Did you, did you actually go to art school? No. No? Didn't go to art school. Didn't go to college. One semester in college. Wow. This is extraordinary then. Is it? Yeah, I think so. Well, I guess you could call me a naive artist. That's okay. Uh -huh. I like that. All right. So, so then just every everything you got was just because you persevered and just kept working through it. Yeah, well, it wasn't really a, a choice like persevering. It's just what I did. It was so automatic. You know? Did you ever want to do anything else? Or did you do something else? Or are well, you doing I, something I, else? <laughs> I always did something to make a living. I had to do something to make a living. And it was always kind of related, you know. It was like... Uh, my first job was in an animation studio. Oh. It was at uh, De Patty Freeling. I don't know but where I, that is, but... Well, the, they did... Uh, Fritz Freeling, you know, did... Uh, oh, Fritz Freeling. Bugs Bunny. And yeah, 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 else, yeah, okay. Know, Looney Tunes and all did that. Did you work in in uh, Burbank? Yeah. Okay. And... Uh, but I didn't have a great job. It was like... Uh, I worked in the ink and paint department, cleaning cells. Oh, uh -huh. Back then, the animation was all done on uh, plastic cells and stuff. And uh, and then after about two years, they uh, started sending all the work to Korea. So that ended that. And then oh, I got wow. into technical illustration and then into graphic design. And so I always did uh, work that was sort of related to you know, illustration. I did illustrations for... Uh, like the recycler and uh, you know whatever small publications and stuff. The recycler was um, a newspaper that you mostly got like if you wanted to buy and sell stuff, especially cars. And yeah, it came out weekly, and you got it at Seven uh, Eleven. You know, yeah. Like that. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, yeah, and they always had the cover illustration. Cool and how did you get those jobs? I mean, were you just applying? There was 
it was on somewhere in a newspaper and you just went and applied you brought a portfolio or no yeah, i guess i don't know how i did it back there i did we did uh when i started freelancing we did uh hundreds of uh video jackets vhs jackets and then cd jackets and all those kinds of things i'm still doing that oh, not, you do? not not video covers well wow. obviously but uh book designs and things like that so I've always made a living mm -hmm. in uh, related fields, you know. Well, you never talk about any of this stuff, so this is why I don't know anything like this. Yeah, and we work out of our home here, so, uh, you know, when the, uh, I used to work at a place, and then uh, the first computers came in, you know, apples and stuff like that, and uh, it quickly shut down all the departments, the photo department, all, you know, the stripping departments, everything, because, you know, everything could be done in, on the computer. And I thought, yeah, I could buy one of these and do it myself. Mm -hmm. you know, and that's what I did. Got lucky enough to get, you know, one or two clients, and we still have a few, and uh, make did, a go of it. Did you have to learn Photoshop? Yeah. And so you self-taught? Yeah, basically. But, I mean, it was easy back then, because there were... Uh, not many programs, you know, there was Photoshop, there was Illustrator, there was, uh, back then it was PageMaker, which was the page layout. So there weren't a lot of them. And in truth, a lot of these programs haven't changed very much over the years. Mm -hmm. I mean, they get more filters, they get more menus, they get more, but it's basically still the same thing, you know, manipulating uh, uh, little digits and stuff like that. So, mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm lucky. She has uh, that it doesn't change so much. You know? Yeah, no, but but plus you were in on the beginning of it, so it's easy to make the graduations with them. Yeah, you know, if you just dropped into it like from outer space, that might be a little tougher. Yeah, I always think it's amazing that one of the things that's amazing is, you know, the problem was uh, storage. You know, so you'd get these big uh, devices to plug in, and it would hold like. You know, four or eight uh, megabytes of stuff, you know. Yeah. Something. And where did you store all this stuff? And now you can get uh, anything on like a thumb drive or something. And, uh, you know, it's like as big as, you know, 30 computers. Yeah. Were back then. Yeah, you never have to worry about that. And, right. and now that there's a cloud too, backing it up is easy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, when you were doing your own, I mean, you're always doing your own work. How did you start showing, showing pieces? Hmm. I mean, were you just accumulating work and at some point you were just thinking, I, I got to get rid of this? Well, I still haven't figured that out. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't know. I, we were downtown eventually. You know, we lived in Venice and then we moved downtown and there was a bit of a scene. And uh, back then it was a little different, you know. You could... Back then, like what, the 80s? Yeah, you know, the 80s, 80s and, uh, you know, people would, gallery owners or uh, at the uh, Municipal Art Gallery, there was Josie Nianko Sarles, who was very willing to look at work. And that was sort of my first, uh, you know, big solo show at the Municipal Art Gallery there. And uh, that led to some dealers and stuff. All that's over, you know, and I don't deal with that stuff. But, uh, Back then it was, uh, it was a little different, a little easier. You know. So, I, I mean, you just went to Josie and you said, hey, Josie, I've got some work. You want to take a look at it? Basically, that's what people did, I think. Yeah, they, and mm -hmm. then she's like, yes, I, I want this. Let's schedule a show for you. Uh, well, it wasn't quite that simple, but I had to go <laughs> back a few times with other work and stuff. But also, you know, you'd have a studio downtown and there would be tours downtown and stuff. And, right, uh, right. Now, at that first show, do you remember if you sold work? Sold. It wasn't really a, a show to sell stuff because I was at the municipal art gallery, but somehow virtually everything sold. Yeah. <laughs> it was it. So, it got good reviews and stuff. So at the municipal art gallery, things weren't for sale? Uh, you could. I mean, it wasn't. it's not a commercial gallery. Right. But, you know, if somebody wanted to buy something, they didn't have, like, a price list. You know, oh, was, well, then they were for sale. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
And so, and then, as you said, that you people found you at that point and then started to ask you to participate in things or ask you for work? Hmm. Well, no, no nobody, nobody really sought me out. I, I would say every, uh, most of the shows I've done, I've had to seek them out. You know? mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I didn't know, you know, sometimes you wonder how it works, especially, you know. I still wonder. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But you wonder, you know, if you're having, a, if you put your work in some place and it's just successful, and you said art dealers were interested. Yeah, and I out out of that there were like two or th- the show at the Municipal Art Gallery it got good reviews, and uh, and then there were like two or three dealers who were interested, and I went with one of them. And I don't want to get too much into gossip and stuff like this, but you don't have to. It it went okay. They sold work, and they got some good shows and uh, I made enough money to buy a truck and uh, and that was one chapter you know? yeah and, uh, but, but you kept doing it yeah I always do the work sometimes there's no interest in it and sometimes there's some interest in it and, uh, but you keep doing it you know? do you ever have moments when you're like I'm good, that's it I'm not going to do this anymore uh, I haven't until recently uh, in the last uh, year or so, particularly during the pandemic, you know, before that, well, there would be a show, some opportunity to show here or there, you know, but during the pandemic, that kind of fell away, and so uh, became more introspective about it, I think, and started thinking about the materiality of art, and why am I doing this and stuff, and uh, I remember so, talking there's always to always an existential issue, I, you know. But. I remember talking to you and you telling me, I think I'm just going to, I'm just not going to do this anymore. I'm going to mm. give it up for a while. And I, I remember looking at you and going, what? Yeah, <laughs> what are you telling me? So, but I got, I'm back into it now. I'm not quite up to speed, but working slowly and doing more, less, I would say, theoretical work and more personal stuff, you know. When you Just talk, for myself, you know. can you define theoretical? What means what theoretical work means to you? Well, I don't know. Here we can People... turn this. Why don't we turn it? We're gonna show. We're gonna show you some things. Well, let's walk okay. over here. Come on over. Might as well. Okay. Let's look at this. Well, so these are. Uh, I was doing work. These are. I'm gonna take you guys closer. Go ahead. Keep. Talking. I called these uh, woodworks, and I was trying to come up with. Uh, you know, I'm always trying to figure out what to do art about. What is the subject? Yeah, Yeah, that's a hard thing. And I thought of what is the most, one of the most ubiquitous items that you can think of, and that was wood. You know, it's trees when they're alive, and uh, when we cut them down, they're all around you. You know, they're all around us here. Wood is everywhere. What could be more ubiquitous? And uh, so it seemed a, a good subject, an interesting subject. So I started doing paintings of wood, and uh, they're representational, but when you get into them deeply, you can, when I was doing them, I sort of dealt with them like a, like an abstraction, you know? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's some, some people were looking at these pieces. I'm walking you guys back now. Um, some people were looking at these pieces, and they're like, oh, my gosh, they're so detail-oriented. And um, they definitely are. Is that a way that you like to work? Are you more of a detail guy? I, I don't ever see anything come out of you that's haphazard. Yeah, I'm not. I wish super I, free. I don't. I don't. I even, wish I were more of an expressionistic artist. You know, I mean, my favorite art is uh, I would have to say is probably German expressionism. Oh, you know what? You I know, can see it, that about but your I'm work. Not, you know, I know people like, you know, Roderick and... Uh, yeah, he's Roderick very flowery. All these people, they're, you know, they're gestural and everything like that. And I'm not. I wish I was, but I was... I'm slow and... Uh, uh, meticulous. Take, meticulous. It takes time, you know. And, uh, well, you can see it in your work. Mm-hmm. But, you know, it's really interesting looking at these woodwork pieces. 
I mean, they're obviously meticulous and detailed, but they don't, they're not overworked. They're not too tight. You know, they don't make me do this. <laughs> you know what I mean? There's definitely a freedom about them. Yeah, well, you know, subject is always a thing. What are you going to paint? You know, it's, a, it's been a problem since the invention of photography, you know. Um, you know, artists didn't used, didn't used to have to worry about that. You know, they were doing portraits, landscapes, everything. And photos came in, and all of a sudden they're like, oh, shit, you know. Yeah, what are we going to do now? You know? <laughs> we don't have to do, we don't have to document people's families anymore. Right, so that became a whole new thing. I always sort of uh, see that as a parallel to what all artists and all mediums are facing these days with the rising of AI, you know, artificial intelligence. This is a big People are going to have to grapple with this in some way, you know. There, so, now, how do you feel about AI? Because, I mean, as a graphic artist and a person that works on computers, what's your feeling around this? Uh, this is a big deal I, in the I group. People are, uh, I mean, even the tech giants are divided on it, you know. Elon Musk is like, ah, let's put it on hold for a while. And you know, another one is like, full steam ahead, you know. And, you know, we're just passengers, so yeah. whatever happens, happens. Do you feel threatened by it? No. No? No. But when I do, uh, especially when I do, you know, things like these. Uh, the wooden pieces? Yeah, they're, you know, crafty. Uh, not crafty, but, you know, but, they're made of, of uh, debris and uh, stuff and, uh, you know, wine corks and whatever. And... Uh, so it's not really you know, in the realm of, uh, of AI yet. You know. Yeah. Um, because, I mean, I know that there are a lot of artists, even artists in this group, who are, are fearing the AI, fearing that somehow, number one, there won't be anything left for them to do. But number two, fearing that their style, their work, will somehow be infiltrated by AI and that somebody will be able to do something in their work, their style, without their knowledge, without their permission, and without the money to back it up. Yeah, uh, well, I don't know if the I don't know if these are like well founded fears or not. Yeah, I it's the way things go and, and virtually everything that comes along, every every technical innovation or revolution that there's a upside and there's a downside you know? I feel I feel the same I feel, I'm like I don't feel threatened by it at all I'm just like curious to see what's going on and you know at some point some decision is going to be made somewhere as to how far it can or cannot go yeah I would probably be <clears> a little worried if I worked in the entertainment industry you know and I was a writer I know the writers talk about it they're on strike now or you know even actors or stuff or you know Right now, you can the AI, you know, uh, versions of people are can still tell, but in ten years, you know, they can just create actors. You know, that's interesting. I never even thought took thought about taking it in that direction. Yeah. Hmm. Interesting. Anyway, okay. So let's go back to your work. Okay. All right. So now that we know what theoretical means to you. And now you say that you're working more personally. Yeah. Well, I mean, after I did these woodworks, then I started to do, I call these scrap works, you know, I made these. So I mean, they're, I'm going to have to I think they these. can see them back there. They can see them, but they, they are not going to be able to see exactly what ha what's going on here. So excuse well, so my it, terrible these, camera work. But here, let's talk about this, this suit piece. Yeah. That, these are... Scraps of wood. I'm just coming up close so that you can see. And I'll put With these, that. I was trying to make things of uh, of uh, great intrinsic or perceived value out of uh, things that had no value. Basically, scraps of wood. I saw them right, from and I saw that there's like pencils embedded in some of these pieces. Yeah, that's a flag, and, and then that's a, a Van Gogh self-portrait, which is probably. The second most valuable painting you can conceive of. You know, yes. Uh, Which next works, to the Mona Lisa. I the suppose. Mona Lisa. Okay. I was like, what are you calling the first one? But when you can come up close here, and then you can see like 
Here's a broken handle from a paintbrush. Here's a pencil. There's another pencil, and there's just little pieces of wood. Yeah, and then here's a uh, violin made out of uh, corks and stuff like that. And uh, your skull is pretty cool too. Well, the skull, yeah, this is uh, scary. <laughs> <laughs> this is scary. <laughs> And here's another piece, too. This is more like your artwork. Kind of a transitional piece. Yeah, more like the theoretical pieces here. I'll back up so now you can see them. Mm -hmm. And just so you can see for scale, here's my hand. Here's, it's, it's a bit like. Well, it's exactly the size of the original. Yeah. Oh, is it? Disconnected. Oh, Lordy. You mean on the. Uh, oh, here we go. We're back. Okay. I just, I think I lost you guys for a second. I hope that you can still see me. And hear me. We're just going to continue on. Pretend it's okay unless they tell me otherwise. Oh, now we're down to one person. It's two people again. Okay. I thought I lost you all there for a while. So your work is more personal now. Well, yeah. When, like I say, I took a break or I didn't feel motivated. And then I did a, uh, a uh, self-portrait there out of scraps. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, I think the first self-portrait I've ever done, except for some sketches. It's the first one you've ever done? Yeah, I did a few drawings, but yeah, that's it. I think so. That's so funny because I think self-portraits are such a good way to gauge where you are in life. Okay. I'll, uh, <laughs> maybe number two is coming up. I do think about it because, you know, you know what they say about, you know, it doesn't matter what you paint, you're in everything. And there's some something that you're going through in life that's being represented in your painting, even if it's a painting that you're doing for somebody else, it's inescapable. Mm -hmm. And I feel like when you're doing your own self portrait, you are really showing yourself and whoever else wants to look at it, who you are in that very moment in time. Sometimes it's hard to see. And sometimes it's great to see, depending on what you're going through. Yeah. Well, I think part of it is uh, I never really like the way I look very much, but now that I'm getting older, I kind of see, you know, a little interest in it, you know, some uh, signs of wear and tear and uh, cracks and crags, and, you know, suddenly there's a little visual interest. For me, you know. Are you an introspective guy? Like yeah. self, that sort of thing, self intro, introspection? I would say so, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Interesting. It's just interesting to me that you're talking about your self-portrait, but it's all. But you're only like looking at the what you what you look like. Well, who wants to see you know some glamorous thing? I don't know. I don't know. I think Van Gogh, you know, painted his self-portraits, and uh, yeah, each one of them. I mean, his ear cut off, and uh, you know, it's all. I have to. I'll tell you this story very quickly. Um, I was taking classes to learn how to paint. And it was just locally, and I was taking them with a bunch of kids. But one of the, I, the teacher said, you know, it's time for you to do a self-portrait. And I was like, I don't really want to do it. But I'm like, okay. So I sat down, and I had some charcoal, and I was starting to sketch out my, myself. And as I was doing it, I got to a certain point, And I, as I was looking at it, I could not stop crying. I was, I, all these little kids are around me, like, why is she crying? Why is she crying? They're telling the teacher. Oh, the teacher's just like, oh, she's so happy to see herself. But I knew that as I was looking at this picture, that there was something deeply sad about this portrait that I had, that had emerged about myself. And I could see what I wasn't addressing, like in my real life. I was, I was suddenly seeing down on this page, and I was, I was sob, I sobbed. Wow. I, I absolutely sobbed. Um, I later put paint all over the charcoal, and then it didn't have the same effect in, on me anymore. It didn't look quite as sad. But in that black and white version, I totally, it totally addressed some things that I was avoiding. And uh, and I just sort of remembered that moment in time and how powerful my self portrait was to myself. And I sort of held that that like when you do a self portrait, you're it's sort of revealing things that you don't even know that you care about or that are bothering you or you know, that are affecting you. It's hmm. just sort of interesting. Do you still have it? Uh, my sister has it. Oh. Yeah. Those black males she's holding. <laughs> no, she's not <laughs> holding it. It's, I mean, honestly, it was very remedial. 
but uh, but you know, it, it served the purpose in the moment. Well, it's always uh, interesting and uh, amusing when you drag out old work. I did that not long ago. Right. Pulled out all my old portfolios and looked at these drawings and stuff I did. I couldn't believe I did those things. Yeah, there's that part too, right? Well, yeah, I used to, you know, sit hunched over a table with, you know, a Crowell pen and ink and spend hour after hour after hour just uh, doing these line drawings and stuff. You get lost in your work while you're I doing it? I did back it. then. You don't anymore? Mm. No, the process, since I started taking it more seriously, I mean, like I said, I'm not a big gestural artist. I don't get in the moment of painting. Uh, I get, I see something, I get an idea, and uh, and then I have to make it. And the process in between is just, it can be annoying, you know, even like just work and stuff like that. There, there are moments, you know, where you know, maybe 45 minutes or something when you, uh, when I get lost in it. But mainly it's just, God, how am I going to do this? Now I got to do this. Now I got to do this, you know, and uh, to get to the end point. And then when you get to the end point, you know, there are three possible outcomes. You know, there's like, it comes out uh, about like you expected, or it comes out better than you expected, <laughs> or it comes out worse than you expected, you know. <laughs> what do you do with the ones that are worse than, than you expected? Uh, put them away. Uh, that's actually the case with a lot of art, but I put it away and look at it six months later. Well, now, because your per perspective can be different. I agree. Now, what do you usually find six months later? Do you, do you look at it and think, you know what, it's not as bad as I thought it was? Yeah. It, or is it still really crappy? Or <laughs> I mean, Usually it's... it's uh, improve because you tend to when you're in the process of working you tend to uh, fixate on small areas and uh, and then you're like oh, I really fucked that up you know and, and then you can't stop looking at it you know yeah but then when you put it away and you pull it out again you're not even looking at it. you're not even aware of that you know? although you may become aware of something even worse something else <laughs> <laughs> now, do you go back into that old work and like try to rework it, or do you just usually leave it alone? Uh, I don't rework it. No, I can't remember doing that. Maybe once or twice, but and the work I'm talking about is, uh, or I was initially talking about is, you know, from back, way back, you know, decades ago. So. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, people have done. I mean, I. Who, some painter, I mean, I'm trying to remember who it was. I don't think it was Diebenkorn. It might have been somebody else. Oh, I like Diebenkorn. Yeah, I do too. Uh, but, but somebody walked into his studio, and there was an old painting, and the person that walked in was like, I really love that painting. She came back like two weeks later, and she's like, that painting changed. And he's like, nothing's safe in here. <laughs> Which makes sense, you know? If you see something, then just because you called it done once doesn't mean that it has to be done forever. Yeah. Well, the thing I always liked about Diebenkorn is uh, it was totally comfortable, and it, it's so unheard of, working as an abstract artist and as a figurative artist. He had these two bodies of work, and, uh, you know, they conjoined once in a while, but basically they were pretty distinctive. Mm -hmm. yeah. I would, I would say, do you work abstractly? I mean, because your work is all pretty figurative to me. Well, I when, I, when I did these things, I was trying to, uh, I was doing representational work. It is representational work, yeah. but in the getting into it and the compositions and stuff, I can look at them in an abstract manner, you know. Yeah, I can see how they would walk the line both ways, but I mean, there is no, I mean, the ad idea is abstract to me, but the execution is not. Yeah. Well, like I say, you know, subject is, you have to come up with a subject, and uh, in abstraction, you often don't have a subject, so I need to have a subject. Yeah. Abstraction can often be just like, you know, this looks cool, and this is interesting, and I think there's lots of abstract artists, though, that do work with the subject, and then just the subject sort of falls away later. 
Mm -hmm. um, as, as they're painting, you know, it starts as a landscape, let's say, and then just sort of loosens into color. Yeah, I'm not sure. I've always rejected that a bit. You know, yeah. Because yeah, do one or the other. You know, I don't know. But, so I always loved uh, Jasper Johns. You know, mm -hmm. he was very influential in my thought process because he, uh, what he did was he just took uh, subjects that were really mundane, a target. Uh, numbers, uh, whatever, and then so you, you maps, so you get the subject, you appropriate the subject, and mm -hmm. you have a subject, and that's dealt with. And then you can paint the hell out of it. Mm -hmm. You know, which I thought was you know a pretty good approach. Yeah. Who um, besides German expressionism painters, who else influenced you? Did you do a lot of reading around artists and stuff, trying to find out like about their lives, or was that just not important? Uh, well, I did it early on, you know, when I was a, a young, you know, our mother would take us to the library and I'd check out uh, 10 art books, you know, and go through them you know, and, and take them back and get 10 more. And that's how I sort of learned about uh, the art world and, uh, you know, artists and art history and stuff like that. Was your family artistic? Like, were your parents artistic in any way, shape, or form? Uh, well, was we came influence? from, I was born in Holland, and we uh, emigrated here, and uh, they were kind of nuts and bolts, you know, get shit done. Uh, art is nice, you know, but it's really important to, you know, I had a little bit of a tough go of it, and, uh, but you really need to, you know, make a living. How old were you when you came over, did you say? Five years old. Five years old? Mm -hmm. That's funny because, I mean, Holland has a long-standing tradition of arts and innovation, and, I mean, it's not surprising to me that there's some sort of connection there. Yeah, I suppose. You never thought about it? Uh, yeah, well, Holland does have that uh, rich history of art. Not so much of cuisine and other things. Yeah, but, the cuisine uh, sort of, unless you like stamp pot. Right. But, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, you're right. Um, but I mean, but arts and figuring things out and, you know, um, I, I mean, they, they've got all the, they had all kinds of ideas. I mean, even just the fact that they figured out how to make marshlands into land for growing vegetables and grazing animals. Yeah, you're right. I should have been a farmer. Uh, but I mean, they were really, they they really figured stuff out. Yeah, no, it's a great uh, country, and uh, uh, but you know, my parents left. They, my father was a uh, in the Holocaust. He was uh, him and his brother were the only survivors of his family. And, oh my uh, gosh! And so in Holland, they kind of made a go of it, you know. But I really think they really wanted to leave, you know. And uh, America looked like a great place to go to. You know, so well, that's lots, where they went. Yeah, know. lots of people thought this exactly that. And I think because of his background and their background, they were always, uh, uh, like I said, you know, art is a great hobby, but you really have to, you know, make a living and you know go to work and. Uh, stuff like that, which is fine. You know. mm -hmm. um, I was looking in the other room and I saw some, maybe you can pull one of these pieces down where you have a center figure and then you have a bunch of little works all the way around them. Oh, the tile works? Mm -hmm. Can you can you grab one of those, one that you like? And I want to, yeah. let's, I want you guys to see this. Hi, you guys. Excuse my hand. That's the one I was hoping for. Oh, nice. <laughs> okay. This is a little bit bigger than. So let's. Here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to I'm going to step back. So it's a little can, heavy. Yeah, it's okay. I got it. And yeah. can you talk about this piece and what you were thinking when you did it and how you did it? Well, these are I called these tile works and uh, the center 
panel is uh, painting on canvas and all the uh, surrounding pieces are uh, painted now. tiles and uh, so ceramic tiles yeah ceramic tiles and I did a series which re was uh, sort of based on uh, location place uh, they're kind of political I did a piece about uh, local Highland Park area and then it expanded to uh, the state I did some about of the state of California and this is kind of a national one so this is the uh, uh, the Statue of Liberty and this was the original French rendition of the Statue of Liberty and can you I, imagine if she was in New York Harbor naked like that how many people would have an opinion about I know <laughs> and so I've got all these political things things about the country you know and here's like Colin Powell in the three stages oh. when he was uh, an apologist for or a, a mouthpiece for the My Lai massacre and here he is you know with the uh, Iraq invasion and here, he's, here he is later holding up the fake uh, 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 poison that supposedly Saddam Hussein was spreading you know and then here's uh, Teddy Roosevelt and Bush kissing us so it, it's all fairly you know um, political. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Georgia says that she loves this work. Oh. She's watching. Okay. It, it, Thanks, it's Georgia. a beautiful piece. It's very heavy, and you can see how it's rather large. It's about half my size. <laughs> it's. I, I really... I, 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 you're right. It says so many things politically, at least to me about the vulnerability of freedom mm -hmm. and all these facets of it, which aren't free at all. It's, it's really super interesting. Well, thanks. Yeah, so welcome. this is uh, the more, you know, subject heavy stuff, you know. Yeah. Oh, I didn't even notice that the Statue of Liberty, like the American version was behind her. Right. And is this all paint that you used on that? Uh, it's acrylic on canvas, and then the uh, tiles are painted. And I did them, these particular ones, in blue, like uh, Dutch blue kind of, you know. Mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah, sort of and like the Delft them, blue. Delft blue and painted them and uh, baked them. And, you know. Did all that stuff. Yeah. So the tiles, are they clay tiles? There are tiles from Home Depot. Oh, that kind of tile. Yeah, okay. Like bathroom tiles. Oh, okay. So you already got pre-fired tiles, and then you painted on top yeah, of them. Yeah, with special paint that's designed for that. And, and ah, okay. Now I understand. Yeah. I'm I was not, wondering how you got all that detail out of glaze. Now I know. No, no, I'm not. Uh, not You're not so a ceramicist. I'm not a ceramicist. No. Well, that makes sense. I mean, I mean, not that you're not a ceramicist, but I mean, it makes sense now the the way I can see so much in your tile work. Mm -hmm. They're really, they're really wonderful. Um, in terms of painting, so you drew mostly as a kid, but then you integrated, you moved towards color. How did you teach yourself how to paint? Was it just trial and error? Yeah, well, I don't know. I'm not sure how difficult it is. You just do it, and you and in you know what? <laughs> As an artist, I understand this statement. No. You just do it. But people that aren't artists, they don't know what that I means. I know, but the thing about <laughs> art, see, like art is well. It's a, this is a different subject, but but the visual arts, the plastic arts, it's different from any uh, from the other art forms because uh, in music, you know, people can uh, or hearing the work. They know if you can play or not. You know what I mean. And you know, if you read a novel, you kind of have a uh, uh, sense of whether a. Uh, oh, Hello. Good morning. You kind of have a sense of uh, whether uh, the person knows, you know, fundamentals of writing or something like that. You know, you have to have some. But in, in art, anything goes. Basically, you know, you can uh, slap shit on there, and as, as long as enough people agree it's good, you know, and those people who agree it's good are not 
necessarily the audience. It's, you know, uh, a consortium of uh, dealers and critics and, uh, and uh, curators. You know? mm -hmm. So, you know, the, the approval in the art world, at least on the, on the highest level of the art world, comes from the top. And everybody else who goes to museums and stuff, they just look at it, which is completely different than in music or books. I'm oversimplifying, but it, in yeah, those yeah. areas, the demand comes from the bottom up. You know, people like it and listen to it and buy it. Or whatever. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, no, I understand, I understand what you're saying. I and, think what you're saying is, and I'm going to just paraphrase here and, and change the words around and see if it makes sense. Um, so what you're saying is that in other forms of art, having the skill and then making the art make a difference. But you feel like that maybe in art, like in, in painting or drawing, or if, if you can get it on the page, even if you have no skill, and people agree around you, the people that make a difference in the right. world, agree around you that it's good, then you, you're free to keep working. <laughs> yeah, you don't, have, you don't have to possess the traditional skills. True. You know? Although and, I find, and also, I mean, also in art, there's a, there are, you know, installations and and all kinds of conceptual stuff, and yeah. all of that is in the art world. And who knows if those people even have any backgrounds at all in drawing or painting, you know, for better or worse, you know what I mean? That's true. Although I do wonder if imposter syndrome starts to take over their lives. I mean, if you conduct your life as an artist and you can only draw a stick figure makes me wonder, you know, at what point do you feel guilty about that? Or do you ever? I don't know. I don't know. There are even artists like uh, Jeff Koons and others who mm -hmm. don't do any work. They come up with an idea and they hire craftspeople to create it. Right. And that's art. You know? Right. I can see that happening, especially like in sculptural worlds where or big uh, public pieces where, you know, there's no physical way for you to do all the concrete work, rebar work, or whatever it takes to get your piece up, yeah. you know, and you just supervise. Yeah, Ai Weiwei does that. He has, uh, right. this ha has, you know, hundreds of craftspeople to build this shit. You know? Right. It starts to make your head spin. Well, it does, little. yeah. And it starts to question, starts to make you question what is art and everything like that. Which is good, I guess, you know, to yeah. question those things and... You always have to hash it over again and again. One more time. We keep coming in and out. Um, there's always, I just saw somebody pop up into the feed. Julia Cummings is now watching. And I know I'm going to hit a subject that I know that Julia is familiar with. There's um, and I, Cy Twombly. Cy Twombly. Funny you should mention that. <laughs> really? Do you have a story about Cy Twombly? No, I don't have a story. And I don't want to go ahead. Okay, I'm going to tell you what we're going to say. Cy, Cy Twombly, I guess there was um, a big show at one of the museums or something, and one of the pieces of work, which was a giant scribble drawing, um, just, and the work was going for like 3.2 million or mm -hmm. something like that. And um, somebody in the group, and I especially remember Julia's comment about it, that she was especially irate about it, you know, that her grandchildren could do something like this. And how is he, how is this possibly worth 3.2 million? And my point was about the whole thing was, okay, we may all think it, but nobody's doing it, but he did it. He's the first, one of the first people to actually call it art. And now is making a conversation, even in retrospect, about whether it's art or not. And it's doing its job. It's making you talk about it. So therefore it's art. You know, <laughs> there's a lot, there's a lot of stuff that, that goes around with that. And I was just thinking about how that makes people people's heads spin too. How can that be art when there isn't what people would consider skill behind it? Well, there are a lot of, uh, you know, gestural painters I like and a lot of abstract painters. I must say that Cy Twombly has always eluded me. Oh, so you're on the side of why? <laughs> why for Cy? <laughs> well, yeah, I guess. I yeah, know. I don't know. But uh, it's fine. That's, that's funny that you were... Why for Psy? Why funny. for Psy? Right. <laughs> uh, yeah, and, you know, like I said, uh, art, you know, these uh, 
it's got this monetary component, you know, I mean, you do, and it's impossible to uh, escape it. You do artwork and, and uh, at some point, maybe you sell it and then you have to decide, is it worth zero dollars or worth 450 million? And it's somewhere in between. No other, you know, art has, the, no, none of the other art forms deal with this, you know, this kind of shit. So. You know, but there's, there's a whole nother thing that's tied into that though too. The person that makes it has to hold its value close to them in order to get what they think it's worth, I think. Because, I mean, if you have one doubt that it's possibly worth zero as opposed to a million dollars, that doubt can get pretty big. I mean, you have to, you have to hold that your work is worth that. And that it's valuable in that way. Because I think if you don't hold that, it's really hard to get there without it. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is something I think about probably too often, you know, especially when if somebody if somebody likes a piece, you know, and and uh, I mean, I'm always happier when other people sell my work a dealer or somebody else. You know, I don't want to deal with it myself. You, you know? and most artists. When I, when I do it, I'm like, uh, oh, they really like this piece. Uh, you know, 100 bucks. Come on. Yeah, I want you to have it. I know. You know, the, And any dealer would be like, what are you nuts, man? What the fuck are you doing? You know? Right. Because you're undercutting your work. You <laughs> are. One. And you are. Yeah. Yeah. No, I understand. I understand. I have that feeling too. When somebody wants something, I was like, "Oh, I'll just make you one," you know. Mm -hmm. I know. <laughs> yeah, but and then somebody's somebody just reprimanded me yesterday. I said, "I'm like, don't buy it here. I'll just make you one." And she's like, "No, I want to support you. Do you not understand?" <laughs> and I was like, "Oh, okay, right. I forgot." Yeah. It's a hard thing. So, do you have representation right now? No. No? So everything that you do and get out is all on your own? Yeah. Yeah, I don't sell a lot of work these days. I don't, I'm not that in, I, you know, a long time ago after this period in the 80s where I was doing well with the work, you know, I figured out, well, I make a li good living doing this other stuff, you know. And so the art I just do, and if somebody buys it, fine. It's icing on the it, cake. Fine. But, uh. I make a living, a better, you know, I make more money doing, you know, my graphic design per hour than I could ever, you know, if I sell a painting, when I break it down hourly, it's, I'd be better off working at McDonald's or something. You know? Right, right. when you start looking at how much you charge for it. I understand, and, it's, and that is depending on how detailed your work is. Of course, when you start putting in the hours, you can almost never recoup the amount of time that you put in it and what you think your time is worth. Yeah. It's hard. It's very hard. So I try not to think too much about that stuff. I mean, yeah. I do it, and if somebody wants to buy it at some point, fine. Yeah. yeah. It's just, so it's all by accident at this point? By accident? Yeah, like selling work. It's just accidental selling of work. Yeah. I mean, a piece or two gets in a show, and if they want to buy it, great. And it's yeah. just sort of an accident. I mean, yeah. I'm just thinking about. I mean, your work is so great. I mean, you can have giant solo shows. Just all right. Set me up. I wish I could. Okay. I wish you never know. You never know, though. It's. I think it's okay. Here's a here's a little loaded question. I interview so many artists, and many many of them because of where we live are Chicano or Latinx, you know, um, artists. But here, as a white man, how do you feel about the state of the art world? Do you feel like it's closing closing down to you? I mean, for a while there, it was all about white men and their art. Uh, sorry. You're treading on dangerous <laughs> I'm ground. I'm sorry. Here. I'm sorry. I know. I still haven't even figured out my pronouns. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And I've literally, you know, filled out uh, forms where, like, that's the first thing they ask you, you know, what is your pronoun? And so, so I don't know. All these things change. They evolve the, I the art world. And and there are extremes, just like there is in everything. I mean, like, uh, uh, you know, I used to support uh, 
PETA, you know, mm -hmm. people for the ethical treatment of animals. Well, they do extreme things, too extreme sometimes. But sometimes you have to do extreme things. So if there have been uh, uh, things in the art world which have been uh, inequitable, well, now it's maybe shifting the other way a little bit, you know, but hopefully it will correct. You know what I mean? Yeah, I, it's just an interesting position from where I set, sit, um, watching all of this sort of happen. Um, I have a sister who's who's working on an art history degree, and so she was telling me, you know, the statistics of museums are that only 15% of all the work in all the museums is represented by women or other ethnicities. Um, and, and so that leaves 85% for all the white, white men of the world, past and present, and possibly future, I don't know. And we were just talking about that, but then there's also museums only organized by, by race, by religion, by you know backgrounds, and, and who don't allow white people, which is fine, you know, I guess. But it's just, it's really interesting that each side does their own form of prejudice. And, and trying to make some sort of sense of that is really hard. Yeah, well, I mean, the hope would be that, you know, 80 years from now, if, uh, if uh, we're still around, maybe none of that will be an issue because it will have found a balance, you know, and, uh, yeah. and, but I don't know. Yeah, I don't know either. It's just interesting to watch the pendulum swing back and forth because it's definitely not on middle ground as of yet, you know. Yeah, and who knows if it will ever be. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. It's probably the nature of a pen, pendulum that it doesn't ever stop swinging unless you die, right? You've got to be dead to have the pendulum stop swinging. Let's see. Um, let's see what we got over here. Patty Venus. Hi, Patty. I haven't seen you in a while. We were talking about it yesterday. Are the tile works a series? Uh, is asking. Yeah, it's a series. I did, uh, there's a few more in there. I did, uh, I did, uh, probably eight or ten of them. Were they all more. political in, in nature? Yeah, and they were in a show at, I did a show at Avenue 50 Studio, and they showed them in a few other places, and, uh, yeah, they're uh, a series. But the problem, my problem has always been I get uh, I get bored, you know, which is like the worst thing that can happen. The best thing to do if you want to be like a, an artist who has a great career and moves a lot of process, product is uh, do the same painting over and over, you know. That doesn't sound like fun. No, but that's what people do. I mean... Uh, you know, you have to be able to recognize the work. And with my work, if you put it all together in a in a show, it looks like the work of, uh, you know, three or four different artists. You know, I but don't agree. You don't? No. Oh well, that's nice to hear. I don't agree at all. So you think that? You can relate this, that. This this is sort of an anomaly, but I mean, this and this and all these things, and yeah. even your woodwork stuff. And the tile stuff all has your imprint on it. Well, yeah, that this stuff I. You know, sort of purposely put in here because it's related. Ah, so there's Let's other see, things. So this piece here, here I'm going to turn. I'm going to turn goes you back so to the see. goes back to the '80s when I was doing. Uh, well, but the '80s. I call these the primate series. I mean, know. let's face it, the '80s are almost 40 years ago. I know. I know, but I mean, of course, your work would change. It does change. Yeah. Yeah. I don't see you in this work as much, but I mean, the fact that it's 40 years ago doesn't, I mean, I don't, to me, that's Well, like, I think course. if you put the tile work next to this work, which isn't that long ago, nobody would see the connection. I totally see it. Really? Yes, absolutely. I can see it in your line quality right right away. Oh, so you see it, well, you do, you're an artist, so maybe uh, you oh. see stylistic. Uh, maybe. Little, little issues or items, you know. I, I don't know. I see it right. I, I see it immediately. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's good to know. <laughs> you sound like every every artist I know that struggles with style and you know um, working in different mediums and how it changes the look of your work and and now it looks like 
people talk about all the time that it's five different artists or two or three. Oh, you've different... heard that before? Yes. Oh, okay. So it's, just, it's not just it's me. It's not just you. Agonizing over this. Mm -mm. Okay. As a matter of fact, I'm, I'm, there was an artist I was talking to who was talking about having an art show and showing, oh, it was Jeff Ross, and because, that he wanted to do like an art show, both him, but showing two different facets of his work, like as two different people. Because <laughs> he was having this, he has the same ideas about this stuff, that it looks like, you know, two different people did the work. And again, for him, I did not agree. Hmm. It didn't look as <laughs> You know, maybe next time I'll show you my suicide scenes. Ooh, okay. I'd like to see those. All right. All right. Um, all right. Let me let me see if there's okay. I stopped at that question. Let me see if there's anything. Going to be a yard sale in Detroit this summer. Oh, at Clifton. Clifton. Clifton is an artist that works in Detroit, and he does um, all abstract pieces. And he he's been doing a piece or two a week for since like 2020. 2020 Clifton. I think I've got that right. Um, and he's got literally. 100 plus pieces now, and I guess he's going, getting ready to sell them. So he's going to have a yard sale? I guess so. Okay. Georgia says balance is key. That's one way. Yeah. Hi, Gary. Gary's in Ohio. <sighs> All right. Well, I think we're getting close to the end here. Is, is, is there something that you'd like to talk about that I haven't asked you about? Well, I'll think of that as soon as we sign. <laughs> exactly. As soon as it's then over. I will say, oh, oh I should have. I should have. I should have. I should have. Um, well, here, let me ask you. You were talking about the, you're doing these works that are more deeply personal. Mm -hmm. How are you, what What does that mean for you? Well, I haven't done a lot of them yet, but like this one over here. You can't it, just it, point to things. Well, why not? <laughs> here, I'm this, coming to get it. Okay. I'm just going to pick it up. Oh, it's really light. Yeah, this one's really light. Okay. All right, you guys, turning it around. It is very light. And this is more of a, a two a three D sort of thing. It's got like bas relief on it. Yeah, low, low so to speak. And two I'm and just, a half D. I think I posted this one in the group. Did you? Okay. Yeah. Well, so this one is. Uh, yeah. Be careful. I mean, I don't oh. want you to get hurt. Oh, I'm not gonna. Don't worry about that. I got it. You can just point to things. Well, this is a basically. Uh, it's called the studio door, and it's a painting of the studio with a canvas and this uh, cat who kind of haunts me, this cat, we called him, him or her Blanche, and he would only show up for uh, breakfast and dinner, but he wouldn't let us near him, and we felt so bad, and uh, then we bought a house for him, but then a coyote got him, I think, oh. and so he kind of haunts us, so that's him at the studio door, so that's a very personal one. But these, just so you know, these are like actual pieces of wood, so these are like sticking out. It's beautiful. It's actually anyway, that's beautiful. What, that's what I mean by more personal work. This is not a uh, a concept or anything like that. It's just a picture of. Uh, so at this point, how are you determining what your next personal piece will be? I mean, I mean, this this has implications of ideas of things that could have been because of the cat, you know, or things that should have been. It's got ideas of about your artwork because it's your studio door. Yeah. You've got artwork within artwork in that piece. Well, right now I'm not. I can't because of my gradual reentry. I'm I'm not working with concepts. I'm not thinking well, I'm going to do you know woodworks and you know build it up. I'm just doing whatever comes next comes mm -hmm. next. You know, so. Is this one done? It's relatively done. Relatively I guess. done. Do you have an idea for the next one after this? I do. Do you want to share? Uh, well, I don't know. It's, uh, there's this. It's. I want to do a kind of wood portrait of this uh, homeless guy I've been talking to. Who hangs out every day by the. Uh, this guy is like he's Dickensian, you know. He's hunched over, you know. He can barely move and stuff. But he's man. He's such a witty, bright guy, and. Uh, you know, we have these conversations. I don't know what to do for him, you know, but I want to do his portrait, you know. Sort of document his presence. Yeah, which seems a little like taking advantage. So I don't know. I struggle with it a little bit. But, uh, but he's fine with me doing it. So. My personal take on it is 
I think it would be taking advantage of him if he didn't want you to and you did anyway. Mm -hmm. um, but the fact that you're seeing him and that you're having a conversation with him, my feeling is it's, it's a good thing. I mean, you're, you are documenting his presence where he may otherwise be completely unseen. You know, you're seeing something that lots of people aren't seeing. Yeah. So anyway, that's what I mean by more personal work. You know, mm -hmm. there's no uh, art theory involved in this. I'll just piece it together out of wood scraps and stuff. Just and jumping one piece to another without any. Yeah. You know, I really like. Until the, something else happens or occurs. To yeah. Me. I like the way this piece is mostly flat, except for a couple of things that add some dimension, like in the back of that canvas. Mm -hmm. I, I like the way that pops out. It's it's unexpected, but it's lovely. Yeah, it's a little, uh, like I say, two and a half deep. You might look at it and you think, oh, what's happening there? But there's a little bit of depth and a little bit of relief. And... Right. It, it's just outside of calling it sculptural. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I like it. I like it a lot. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Well, I think we're probably... Oh, yeah, we're an hour in. So, oh, okay, that flew <laughs> so, Yeah, it just oh, wait, flies. I got to tell you. Tell me. <laughs> no, you got something to say? Okay. I want to hear it. I won't think of it until later. Uh, of course. <laughs> well, you can tell me later and we can relate. I'll be driving or something and then I'll go, oh, fuck. I should have talked to her. Do you have anything that you want to tell people as an ending thing? Any words of wisdom, pearls, uh, I don't know, avoidances? No, I was hoping they could tell me. <laughs> you never know. Um, let's see. The studio door is lovely. It is absolutely lovely. And Clifton says it's a nice piece, too. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Yeah, I got no pearls of wisdom. You got, got no pearls got of nothing. wisdom? You got nothing? No. That's okay. Okay. All right. Thank you, you guys, for joining us. We'll see you all next week. Talk to you later. Bye. Bye.